Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 131. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra little snippets of travel, history, and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And we have a terrific double feature interview today with the celebrated British knitwear designer Debbie Bliss. So Debbie has worked for over 30 years in the hand knitting industry and she's one of the most published knitwear designers worldwide. And Debbie has also been awarded an MBE, which is a member of the Order of the British Empire. And she was awarded that for her services to the knitting and crafting industries. So back in 2000, I bought Debbie's book, Great Knits for Kids. And at the time, it was the most impressive knitting book I'd ever seen. Every design just looked so gorgeous and complicated to me. And also the way the garments were styled and photographed looked really new and advanced. And I just couldn't believe that knitting could actually look so beautiful. So it was that book that actually got me back into knitting. And I've dug up an old picture here of Madeline wearing one of the garments that I knitted from that book. So back in 2000, of course, there was no Ravelry or Instagram or knitting podcasts. And the closest you got to any designer was just looking at their name on the cover of their book. And I was really fascinated and impressed by this Debbie Bliss character. So it was quite a surreal experience for me to end up interviewing her 22 years later. But Debbie really is a gem. She is totally hilarious. In our first interview, she takes us through her artistic process and her huge creative output. And in the second interview, we chat about her personal life experiences. And that interview is full of funny stories, just of Debbie traveling around the world when she was doing lectures and workshops, and some of the things that went wrong in a really hilarious way. So I'm quite proud of both interviews. I think they're amongst our best, and I really hope you enjoy them as well. Yes, I agree. I think they're great. Um, and then in Bring and Brag, Mum's going to show you her finished project, which she's proudly wearing right now. And I've finished all the aristocracy or high-ranking chess pieces in my knitted chess set. Yes, yeah, so it's Bring and Brag because I have finally finished my version of the Mayron sweater by the designer Natasha Hornby. So I first showed you the design in the last episode and I spoke about the gauge issues that I was having with it. So after that episode, I ripped out almost everything that I'd knitted and I've re-knitted the whole thing, but I'm really happy with it because I actually think it's fitting me perfectly. So first of all, let me show you a close-up picture of the beautiful intricate stitch pattern that's both on the front and the back of the garment. This gorgeous stitch pattern is a modern take on the intricately embroidered bodices found in folk costumes from various cultures. So the garment's body is knitted sideways, so the patterning ends up in vertical panels. And where the contrast cream yarn is used, that's done with slip stitches or mosaic knitting. And the little raised flowers are created by wrapping the yarn multiple times around a cluster of three stitches. That was really time consuming, but I think it was really worth it because it does give such a fantastic effect. And then everything is bordered in seed stitch or moss stitch. So apart from these lovely flower clusters, I have learnt two new techniques through knitting this design. The first one is the double-sided provisional cast-on, which I filmed for you in the last episode. And the second technique is the modified three-needle bind-off, which gives you a really flat seam. So I'm going to show you that technique in just a moment, but first I want to tell you again, because I did tell you in the last episode, how this design is constructed and put together, because it really is interesting and also, if I explain it again, it'll, you'll understand the modified three needle bind off better. Okay, so you start with a provisional cast on here in the upper sleeve and provisional cast on just means that you can pick up your stitches later and knit in the opposite direction. So you start here, you knit the upper sleeve in the round and then you shape the shoulders, this section here with short rows. Once you get to about here, you cast on stitches along the sides with a double sided provisional part cast on which will give you a, a seamless seam an invisible seam seemingly <laughs> and then you get because you're going to knit the body sideways and this is where I had my problem so I didn't knit enough I didn't cast on enough stitches here so that when I was knitting sideways my garment was too cropped so I had to unpick it all and add another 20 stitches to my double-sided provisional cast on was your gauge tighter yes ah, okay. as usual 
So what I did, because I was not working at the recommended gauge, I had to do all rec recalculate all my stitch counts and I made a bit of a mistake. But let me assure you that the pattern is written meticulously and if you don't radically change things around like I like to do and you just follow the pattern really faithfully, you won't have any problems. So after you've cast on your stitches along the sides, you're going to knit the left half of the front and the left half of the back until you get to the center point which is in the middle of the body and then you're going to stop and then you knit the same thing for the right half of the sweater but in reverse so once you've knitted the left half and the right half of the sweater separately you join them together with a center front seam and a center back seam and that's where you use the modified three needle bind off why did she decide to place the seams in the center or the center front and back instead of just the sides? Well, I think for a few reasons. First of all, you have to knit the, the garment sideways so that you get this mosaic knitting in a vertical panel, right? But you wouldn't need to place the seam in the center for that. No, but it's lovely the way she started here. There's no seams here. There's no seams here or mm. there. Okay, and the idea of doing it, instead of just knitting straight across, if you knit it in this way, then you've got a perfect mirror image of the mosaic knitting here. So mm. you've got the stitches on this side, the Vs on this side will do this, okay. the Vs on that side will do that. So it's really the yeah. most logical place to, to put the seam. I didn't think of that. It's very that's, clever, That's Natasha. very cool, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is very cool. So before we go on to the modified three needle bind off, just quickly finish, show you how the rest of it's constructed. You go back to your provisional cast on and you knit the sleeves in the round downwards and you can stop whenever you want. I've stopped for three quarter length. Then you pick up stitches around the neckline here and in seed stitch you knit a neck band and you pick up stitches around the hem and again knitting in the round in seed stitch you keep knitting until you've got the length that you want. The seed stitch moss stitch? Yes I think okay. moss stitch originally is the English terminology and and seed stitch is the American but it's the same stitch mm. okay so now what oh but getting back to the modified three needle bind off most of us have done a normal three needle bind off and I do have my little demo here to show you so when you want to join two pieces of fabric together you usually have them so that you've got them on two different needles and you hold them in the left hand and I've already started doing a bind off to show you and then you have your working needle in the right hand like this and typically what you do for a three needle bind off and you would use this for example on the shoulders of uh, joining the shoulder seams on a garment on a, on a jumper so the front and the back this is how you would do the shoulder seam hmm. so you knit the, st the stitch on the front needle together with the stitch on the back needle. So you turn two stitches into one and then when you've got two stitches on the working needle you take the first one and you put it over the top and that's how you create this bind off and that will give you a really solid seam but the ridge on that seam will be quite high. There is another version where you can purl both stitches together but for that you actually have to start purling the back needle first and then the front needle like that but essentially it's the same thing and then you bind off. So purling both stitches together will change the direction of your bind off. So it'll give you a different look but this, the ridge on the seam will be just as high. Then there's a third version which is what this pattern uses and that's a knit purl combination. So what you're doing is you knit the stitch on the front needle and then you purl the stitch on the back needle. Whoopsie. And it's this knit pearl combination that gives you a really flat seam. Hmm. And that's because in the first two versions, you've got your fabric pieces like this and they're, and they're seamed off together like that. So you've got this ridge right at the top. Whereas in the knit pearl variation, your fabric is actually lying, ends up lying on top of each other like this. So it gives you a much flatter seam. Now, Roxanne Richardson has a YouTube channel where she does a lot of tutorials and she does them in a lot of detail and very comprehensive and she has a long detailed comprehensive tutorial on all the variations of the three needle bind off. So if you want to see this in a lot of detail and very slowly you might want to check out her channel 
But today I just want to give you a quick overview of what this modified three needle bind off looks like in case you want to play around with it. So here you can see that I've almost finished joining the left side of the front to the right side of the front and I'm using three needles so that's why it's called a three needle bind off and the right side of the fabric on both pieces are facing upwards. So I enter my right hand needle as if to knit through the front left hand needle and then I bring the working yarn in front so it's out of the way and I enter through the back left hand needle as if to purl. I then purl that stitch and bring the yarn to the back again. So again it's out of the way but it's also in the knit position. And next I pull the same stitch through the front needle stitch knitwise. And then I bind off. So what I'm doing is purling the back stitch and pulling it through the front stitch knitwise and then binding off. And because the two faces of the fabric are laid on top of each other, it creates a much flatter seam. And you get a really nice decorative knit stitch chain that lies flat on top. So I better mention the yarn that I'm using. It's the John Arben Yarn Adelic, which is a sport weight yarn and it's made from a blend of long wool fibres from the area of Devon, I think. That's mm -hmm. where John Arben Textile Mill is. And Devon is south southeast. Of England. Of England, yeah. Cool. Okay, so, and the colour, this colour is called Woman in Blue. So I'm a woman in blue. And a lady in blue. <laughs> And this, What's sometimes the cream I'm a lady. The, <laughs> some, the cream colour is the natural undyed shade. And that's really quite special because it's not straight cream, it's slightly mm. grey, mm -hmm. a grey. Um, sort of looks a little bit like a pearl. Pearly colour. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Okay, so I've only just finished the design, and I the last couple of evenings I've been sewing up chess pieces with Madeline. So I haven't even... You're a very bad ghost knitter, Mum. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. I did that all by myself. <laughs> I had to because it, it actually takes a long time to sew up these chess yeah, pieces. Yeah. Anyway, what I was trying to get at is I haven't even thought about what I'm going to knit next, which is a fantastic place to be in because the world's my oyster. I could pick anything I want. It's a very exciting thing. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I took a little bit of footage of Madeline modelling this beautiful jumper so, so that you can see it in its full glory and that's coming up next. this gorgeous yarn from the spinning mill fleece and harmony when we visited Prince Edward Island in Canada last year. This is their signature Aran weight yarn in the colorway Autumn Birch. I think it's beautiful. It's going to suit you. Thank you. And me. Yeah, <laughs> as always. Um, but yeah, so the wool for this yarn comes from local Prince Edward Island farms and it's a semi-woolen 
Three yeah. ply. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I've been deliberating over which design I want to knit with this yarn. I've seen many possible designs, but none that really inspired me, and I wanted to love the design that I was going to knit with this stunning yarn. You might remember that Dad knitted this Carbeth cardigan, also using the Fleece and Harmony signature Aran. That bright orange colourway is called Meadow Paintbrush, and you can see Mum's excellent editing skills. I think this was from episode 61. Dad originally knitted the Carbeth for me, but Mum's dragon sickness took over her and she fought me for it. In the end, I let her have it because the colour looks so good on her and I think she appreciates it more than I do. You can actually borrow it back again whenever you want. I'm all right, thank you. <laughs> you can have it. Um, anyway, okay. I was looking through Debbie's um, designs last week because I had to prepare the graphics for the Debbie Bliss patron discount. And I realized that I really like her aesthetic and that she's designed many garments using Aran weight yarn, which is perfect. So I haven't made my final decision yet, but I've narrowed it down to a selection that I would like to show you now. The first one is this cabled vest called Harriet Tank. I love the deep ribbed hem that pulls it around the waist while the top half is still nice and loose. So you could wear a fitted jumper underneath if you want. Now the body of the vest is knitted sideways so the cables run horizontally. I really love this design, but the only problem is that it wouldn't use up all of my skeins, and I think that would be a shame. This next design is also a contender, it's called the Morag Sweater. It's a gorgeous oversized cabled sweater with a lovely yoked neckline that frames the face, and I love how the cables on the sleeves run up over the shoulders and right up to the neck edge. The same with the center front cable. The third design is probably my favourite though. It's called the Sorel Jumper and it's also a cabled sweater. I particularly like that it's cropped and sits in the waist, so I could wear it with a skirt or a dress or high-waisted jeans. Actually, there is a design in the upcoming interview, a Debbie mm -hmm. Bliss interview, that's um, it's, it's, both, it's a vest for a, a woman and a dog. Oh, the Hilary Swank one. Yeah. yeah. So if you have any leftover yarn, you could use it on Jack or else you can actually make the design oversized and it also looks good. So that's another option. I might consider that. I'm not sure I'll, I'll knit a, um, a dog vest in this because I wouldn't want it to get dirty. I think this is too good for a dog vest. <laughs> okay. So first of all, you're doing a swatch. Yep. I'm doing a swatch and also I'm making it extra large, as you can see, because I do not want to repeat the gauge fiasco that I've been having with my modest. So I want to make sure I'm really measuring my gauge correctly. And it's probably going to be about 16 stitches for 10 centimeters. Yeah. That's what the Carbeth was. Yeah. Okay, so coming up next is our interview number one with Debbie Bliss. Are we going to close the doors? Okay, because that might change the light. Well, close them then. Okay. Debbie, give us a smile. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Say a couple of things about each point. <laughs> Husbands are allowed to say things like yeah. that. Vicious, yeah. yeah. If afterwards they compliment you. Yeah. As yeah. long as there's good compliments chucked yeah, in yeah. there. Well, you're Barry's idea of a compliment, so you, you don't. You, I think they look too bad for your age. <laughs> Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I am so excited to be sitting here with Debbie Bliss. Debbie has had a career in hand knitting for well over 30 years. She's one of the most published hand knitting designers worldwide 
And in 2015, Debbie was awarded an MBE for her services to the knitting and craft industry. I first discovered Debbie's work around the year 2000 through her book, Great Knits for Kids, and I attribute this book to getting me excited about knitting again. So it was the most beautiful book, knitting book that I'd seen at that time because the photography was fantastic. Every design looked like a masterpiece. Madeline was two at the time. And in the end, I picked this design to knit for her, which I've brought to show Debbie today. <laughs> I was so thrilled to see it as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting how people use other colours as well, because I love it in this vibrant purple shade yeah. that you use. It's lasted so well. This is a size four. So we started with the sleeves rolled up and Madeline got about five years wear in the end. So it was fantastic. So thank you so much for inspiring me all those oh, years ago. Thank you for making it all those years ago. <laughs> and for coming on Fruity Knitting today. Oh, I'm delighted to. It's a real privilege to be asked. Thank Good. you so much. And I have to just quickly show the viewers that Debbie got out her original swatch for this design. And we figured out that it, because I forgot, because yeah. it's been knitted so many years ago, was it, was it knitted bottom up or top down? And we figured out it was knitted top down. Yes. Because of the pico edging. Yeah, so you can get this lovely delicate pico edge because often with a pico, if you start at the bottom, you have to make it into a hem. And it, I wanted to just kind of marry up the delicacy with the delicacy of the rest of the yeah. texture on there. Yeah, well, Madeline looked great in it. Everybody commented always. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> okay, so Debbie, you are actually one of the best known hand knitting designers here in the UK and you've published 35 books, many booklets, and at one time, you even had your own knitting magazine. I did, yes. So who were your early mentors? And maybe you can show us how your designing mm. has evolved over the years, because we've got some of your books here. Yeah. Um, when I first started designing for magazines, I was really lucky because as you're kind of making your way with compiling the patterns and having to grade them up in different sizes, the um, the style at the time was for big, generous sweaters, so basically, you know, like four yeah. rectangles. But the kind of things I like to knit myself are from these old 1930s and 40s books. And I like the kind of fit of them, but also it was a lovely way of... Um, finding out how to do shaping, particularly in things like sleeve heads, you know, square set in sleeve yeah. or a lovely yeah. curved set in sleeve. So I kind of, I think I got the groundwork for compiling patterns then, right at the beginning. This is one of your early books as mm. well, isn't it? So this was a book called Nursery Knits, and I think at the time, perhaps even now, um, quite influenced by my sort of 1950s childhood, the toys of them, the kind of imagery. But something that I return to again and again is the smock. This is um, an original smock from Bedfordshire, which is where I come from, um, in the 19th century. And one of the things I remember about my great art was talking about how the farmers would come to chapel on a Sunday and you could you would know their status by how much embroidery really? they'd got on them. It's on their smock. So I just love it. I love the history of it. But then I introduce elements of that into children's wear because it's also a great shape, I think, on children, particularly if they've got nappies still. You get that lovely A-line shape. Yeah, that is really beautiful. We'll show some close-up footage of that. And do you wear this? No. <laughs> <laughs> it would look, I think it would look quite, it's think, quite yeah. heavy, but it looks... Yeah quite individual I, I and stunning yeah. Yeah, I think you could uh, chronologically I think Great Knits then there was Great Knits and the idea of that was to, because mostly the books I'd done, if they were for children were for babies, so perhaps up to two years, and so the idea of this was that there was going to be an extension of si sizes to go from small up to the larger sizes, the ten year olds I think that's when I started using different colours as well, because I think that we have such a wonderful palette of colours available now that it's lovely to use the chocolate browns and the stone colours and the greys on children as well. And it was quite new back then to do really beautiful photo shoots, wasn't it? Mm. I think I've always been really lucky because I've worked with stylists and the stylist I worked with is Marie Willis. She just bought a lovely, a lovely look to it. And they're small things by the little gingham headscarves and the bloomers and the, just give a lovely style to it. In fact, actually, sometimes people were more interested in the clothes that went with it than they actually were with the next. <laughs> what have we got here? Yeah, so I think I've been really lucky in that I've had two 
um, styles of designing running um, parallel. One is designing for babies and children, which I love, but also the fashion knitwear too. And I think as I developed as a designer, what I wanted more than ever was to kind of think about uh, proportion, where things fit on the female body. Yeah. And so judging by my own, my own shape, which is fairly triangular, um, I actually thought about how things on me, if they're longer, I wanted more of an A-line shape. I didn't want mm. that kind of strange tightness that you can get with, you know, if you've got bigger hips that are just an uncomfortable, yeah. you don't feel at yeah. ease wearing them. So that's when I started thinking about, say, where does the um, garment hit the body? If it's longer, let's introduce a little bit of shaping in there so you get a lovely A-line and a kind of flow when yeah. you're wearing it in yeah. a drape. When did you start doing children's wear? That was um, actually right. I, the first book I ever had published um, was uh, Baby Knits. And that was when I was pregnant with my son. I um, had lots of ideas of what I wanted to see him in. And then actually, when he was born, bless him, he was very colicky. <laughs> so some of the really, what I thought was incredibly stylish <laughs> knits that I'd made for him, I just couldn't get them over his head. So um, one of the things that that taught me too, that was the other experience was, it isn't just about do they look great in them, but mm. envelope necks or things like sort of, yeah, button fastening. Yes. Yeah, um, the practicality. Yes, the practicality as yeah. well as the style. So this was a, a recent book that came out, I think, a year ago. Mm -hmm. And what I enjoyed about that was I realised that a lot of crafters may start knitting when there's a baby on the way or when mm. their friend's having a baby, but they may not know the technique. So the idea of a uh, baby's first knits was is that every piece that the knitter would be learning something slightly different. So um, on the rompers, they look very simple, but actually on this, it's showing you how to pick up stitches and rib. And that's something I think that perhaps some knitters are a little bit um, wary of yeah. and to get that neatly. And then... I think the last thing in the book is um, the bear sweater, but that's showing you how to do intarsia. Yes. Um, so every step along the way, you're being told another technique. Okay, so that came out a year ago. Yes. It's got lots of techniques in it. Yes, so one of the things that I love about designing a collection is the way that you can tell a story. So on this particularly, I say this was a collection that came out um, last year, I called it Highland Fling because I'm, a, I'm a, a real lover of traditional knits, but I think my style is that I want to give them a more contemporary look. And also when you have a collection, you want to think about people's skill level. So it may be that some people um, don't want to do antarsia or colour work, so have some texture in there as well. So, the, so the, when you're thinking about the collection, you're also thinking about um, where you're going to shoot it. Mm -hmm. So we shot it somewhere that I hoped looked like a Scottish castle. It was actually in deepest Essex, 15 minutes away from the East End. Okay. <laughs> um, but that's another thing, the styling and the lovely stonework. Yes, I love so that. So this here we've is, got a swatch. Yeah, taking a, a traditional argyle, but doing it with a little frill. So you get this little uh, peplum shape and then uh, multicolour, but rather than it be a more traditional fair isle, doing these kind of more graphic ideas and then uh, and strangely actually this cardigan Isabel uh, which, which you've got there it it took the longest for me to do because I'd found these little swatches and then but it was the balance and I think balance in a design uh, particularly texture in a way is really important so I wasn't quite happy with these but then I realised I wanted another element in there of the bobbles to kind of marry it up. Okay, so these are the original swatches. This yes, is how it and started. then it developed. This is one of my favourite designs because I think in, in a circular way it goes back to my love of those 30s and 40s designs, you know, the the more... Um, fitted and tailored. More fitted, yes, yeah. more tailored. I have to say I love this design too. I love the long ribbing, which mm. will sort of nip yeah. in at the waist, yeah. which I really love. And then this gorgeous patterning here and a raglan sleeve. So we would actually really love to see your design process. And you've said that it can mm. be very different depending on the collection. Yeah, yeah. So I thought you could show us two, your process through two very different collections, yeah. including your sketches and swatches yes. and, of course, the final garments. Yeah. 
So one of the things that have been really popular the last year or so have been modern layouts, which I've launched. I love the idea of taking the the vintage layouts, you know, the ones that got little lacy shawls and bonnets, but I always thought were a bit of a, you know, like fingers get trapped in them. Exactly. And make, yeah, and make them modern because I like the idea of a set and that's fun for me to um, design. And I have did a, a fairground fair, fair one. I've done like a little seaside one. But looking back at some of the patterns I did, um, I think almost 10 years ago, there was one that stood out and this was the, the bear pattern in a cardigan. So I thought I'm going to revitalise that. And so came up with the idea of a sweater and a little baseball jacket because that's another style I really love. And yeah, as I, it's very cute. Yeah, and I did throw out the first, I forgot what it is, throw in the <laughs> Seattle Mariners baseball thing. So I've got great uh, games, I've got a great attachment to baseball. And then also a blanket where you're mixing the texture in with um, in the tarts, little, yeah. Mo yeah, little motifs yeah. as well. But I really enjoy doing that. I love that idea of marrying it all up and having this central theme. So on this one, I wanted texture that kind of marry in as well. So bobbles, you know, kind of like um, marry in with a little kind of embroidery knots too. And I worked on some swatching, but I just felt it needed a fresh look. So I contacted a great designer called Lynn Watterson, who I'd worked with in the past and said, oh, can you make these better? And she did. Okay. So she handy. came up with yeah. these lovely textural ideas. So what yarns were you using? Baby Cash Merino. Because Baby Cash Merino is, as I said, the most successful of um, my yarns because it, it washes and wears beautifully. You know, you can have something that you can hand down to, you know, probably three generations and it still looks fantastic. That is so mm. handy. I love that. I'm undoing this because I really like the way mm. you've done this this band here. Yeah. That's a really neat edging. Because I, I so it's like to have a, a, a facing because I think if you're having poppers as well, yeah. you don't really want the kind of rather nicely other side of that. Yes, and it's quite thick here, which mm. is really good yeah. and supported. So they're very classic, elegant designs, but they're pretty easy, aren't they? Easy yeah, they are. I mean, particularly this one was really easy. Yeah. And then over here, we've got something that's a little bit different. Mm. It was a special commission in a way, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, Henry Swank, the uh, actress, is a voracious knitter. And she'd contacted Lovecrafts about a, a yarn of mine that she wanted to use. And there was a kind of dialogue then between her and my wonderful colleague, Marion Willis, and they bonded over a love of horses and dogs. And Hilary was saying about how she had this amazing charity called Karoo in the States, and it puts together, say, abandoned dogs with uh, children who may have come from uh, areas or uh, perhaps families where they just needed that extra love. Yeah. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea. So the idea was is that we would come up with a collection and that all the uh, money from the downloads would go straight to a charity. So it, w it was fascinating, actually. She was absolutely wonderful to work with. I was a bit scared to begin with and a bit in awe. Um, but so she, what... was, she wasn't a diva. Oh, no. That's great. Oh, she was lovely. Um, and so I started off by sending her what kind of shapes are you interested in. Her aesthetic was very close to mine anyway. She liked things that were quite plain. You know, she sent me over kind of ideas that she's got, which I instantly loved. And then I sent over like yarn suggestions. Does it mean to be in a chunky? But I sent her these ideas and as I say, the color palette, the shapes, and then, so this is one, one example of a swatch I sent over, a terribly bad sketch, she was very forgiving, <laughs> and the color palette again. And then in the end, we actually went back to a, uh, a big, big tank that I designed some years ago and shaped it. So you've got a lovely edge to yeah, it. Yeah, you can see that here. Yeah. And then we had lots of sizes made up as well. But also it was interesting, we sent this out to Webbs, the big store in America, for display. And somebody that worked there was saying she was, although she was smaller, she was using this bigger size because she loved the way that actually, rather than it being a big tank, it became like a poncho style. Yes. So I think it has quite a lot of versatility Yeah, and to it's it still well. quite drapey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here you've got little tabs on the mm. side and you can make this longer or shorter, can't yeah. you? Yeah. 
If you like something that's longer and you want to make it more of a tunic, then you would make those decisions here. You would lengthen it between the hem and between the armhole. Mm. Otherwise, you might just end up having a really baggy, big armhole. It's a very easy one to uh, adapt because it's such a simple cable. Great. So she... she is wearing this obviously somewhere well she actually knitted we sent her some yarn as far as i know she's knitted two herself okay. and i did one for her as well and she on her instagram there's a lovely picture of her and her dog wearing oh, lovely because the, there yeah. are dog one dog yeah. versions here we might yes, have to make one, one for jack from... yeah okay that's lovely and it's just two cables so it's pretty elegant yes, and simple yeah. isn't it a thick it's cable really simple and a little one in between and, and what's the it's yarn? in cashmere and arrow mm. yes cashmere and arrow which is really popular you do still have that lovely drape but also because it's aran weight it just knits up that little bit faster yeah okay now around 2000 you started designing yarns yes and now you have at least 20 mm. different yarn ranges connected to your name yep. and i think that knitters are much more interested now in just learning about the technical qualities of a yeah, yarn yeah. and what it's best suited mm. for so i thought mm. you could show us three contrasting yarns yes and just talk about how you developed them including the color palette yeah so one of the yarns that i'm really excited about is nell mohair which i named after my daughter she's um, lucky yeah <laughs> <laughs> actually what she said was it's about time <sighs> yeah um she's got personality i've even there. got a yarn called bill yet so i don't know why she was upset <sighs> um uh, i love mohair it's one of the yarns i first started working with when i was um a student because in a, in a chunky one particularly because I could actually knit in the cinema and it didn't show the holes that I'd made <laughs> so I'd been looking for the perfect chunky uh, mohair and finally found one so the kind of step if you like the journey of that is is then once you find the perfect yarn then thinking about your color palette and because I'd named it after Nell and she loves bright colors think you're going to have a picture of her wearing a bright yellow uh, coat. Uh, that, if you like, informed the colour palette that I wanted to have um, for now. So then I look at all the colours that have been sent to me from the manufacturer, and then I put together what just feels harmonious to me. So a harmonious and palette. And Nell, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I particularly liked actually about Nell was is that it's brilliant for intarsia, as you can mm -hmm. see here. You don't get those kind of ho holes because the fibre melts together. It does. But it also is lovely for lace too. You still get that kind of quality and you can see the lace stitches and the eyelets too. Yeah. So I thought it was win-win and I've loved it. So this is a good example of how um, a yarn can develop. So twice a year, I go to Florence for Pitti Filati, uh, which is a trade show, which is a, you know obviously very hard to have to go there, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Um, and that's where I meet the uh, manufacturers, and they're working and developing yarns for the coming season. So, for instance, in July when I go, I'm looking at autumn, winter, but so, so it'll be 2023. Um, in January, I'll be looking at yarns for spring. And then you can go on this, what I really like, the journey of developing it with uh, a yarn with the manufacturers. So I've been particularly interested in a, a eco wool. I've got an eco cotton, but uh, I wanted an eco wool. So I was sent this yarn, which wasn't as soft as I wanted it and was just slightly thicker. I was looking for something that could knit up to the same patterns in my baby cash merino which is a lightweight dk so it's like 25 stitches 34 rows i swatched in it but as i say i didn't feel it was quite right so then went back to the manufacturer and say can you make it finer can you make it softer which is what he did so there's a lot of back and forward yeah yeah you just say i want this and he yeah. goes okay and yeah. does it send yes. it back to you no not quite right yeah, no. <laughs> luckily you build up a good relationship <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then apologies, Andrew, if it's really scruffy, but the the real fringe I sent off to the manufacturer, I found this really difficult. I could not get the colours right. And then suddenly I walked away from it, came back the next day, and I thought, oh, it needs this. So then the next the stage after sending off the colours to the manufacturers, then they um send back what we call lab dip so that you can you can decide whether you feel that they're very accurately represented mm. what you've sent to them. So, so that's what that did you think was missing 
Was it the red? Or I the... don't know what was wrong with it. It's just, I can remember being at Lovecraft and going, it isn't right, is it? And they're going, no. <laughs> and that's what I missed when I was working from home, that you need that kind of... Uh, Feedback. Yeah, because I asked the postman and he just wasn't interested. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, but then it, it's, when I'm looking at a palette anyway, it takes ages to kind of get that. And it is that harmony. It's all about harmony. Yes. Um, yeah. So then, actually, this just arrived uh, yesterday. So this is the um, finished result, which I haven't had time to knit up yet, but I'm very confident it will be. It feels lovely, and I'm very confident it'll knit up to the gauge that I want. And this is an example yes. of it knitted up yes. or crocheted. So, yeah. It's beautiful. So I'm working on two more modern layettes, and one is uh, in the eco, uh, baby eco wool, and one of them will have a woodland theme, hence the um, Bambi. And then also there's quite a lot of toadstools in it <laughs> and a toadstool <laughs> rattle. Uh, and then also I'm going to do so another cute. set called um, Zoolander and that will have like a zoo theme. You can see so the elephants and Yes, I can see. And, it's yeah. lovely. Oh, that's going to be stunning. Yeah. And you do have a good colour pa palette here. I for feel now it's right. Toadstools yeah. and, and also the soft, more elegant yeah. ones in there as well. Yeah. Uh, so another yarn, in contrast to the other two, this is a cotton blend. This is something else I've been searching for uh, for a long time because I love the idea of a chunky cotton, but the reality is if it isn't blended, it can be shoulder-crushing uh, weight and very stiff. Yes. Um, so Dulcie... It's a is, chain, isn't it? Yeah, it's a chain, so it gives it more structure um, and makes it less likely to peel. So all in all, it's um, a real good yarn to yeah, be able to knit with. it feels with. quite satiny. It. Yeah. And also I find if I'm working with a chainette that you're less likely um, not to go into the yarn if you're just, like, not concentrating properly. Yes, or to you split can... it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I find when I'm thinking about a palette, if I'm knitting with the, the sample yarn, it kind of tells me... Um, what it should be like and one of the themes I was uh, thinking about at the time was Cary Grant into Catch a Thief at the Riviera that made me think of Vivoli which is um, I have to say in July in Florence the heat is unbearable so uh, a lot of us go to Vivoli ice cream parlour which is just wonderful that made me think of Vivoli and then that made me think of having these just kind of really lovely pastels um they are beautiful. He's yeah, the, there's he's one that the... I've realised, of course, Andrew is missing from there, which is this one. Uh, so apart from that, I couldn't come up with an ice cream colour for that one, but there's got to be one. Um, but mint, we have yes. mint, we have banana. We okay. Have, um, they are beautiful, very sort of soft, delicate colours, aren't they? Mm. And slightly um, vintage looking. Yeah, and I think, again, when I'm thinking about a palette, there, there's a point where... I think it's like in everything we do is that when you think, oh, yeah, that's right. And it can take some time to get that. But I felt with this that, yeah, there was a there was a balance. And as I say, I talk about harmony a lot in design and in palette. There's just a bit when you think, oh, I can walk away now feeling a little bit excited. Yeah. And that's what I felt about Dulcie. You said it was a chunky weight, weight mm. didn't you? Yeah. What I liked about it is because it's chunky, uh, it just shows up stitch detail perfectly, which means you can go for really, really simple stitches. But I loved rice stitch. It's one of my favourite ones. Um, and then I was thinking about the cable. I wasn't sure whether that was definite enough. So we went with a, with a bigger cable, which I think if it had been all cotton or in another yarn would have just been too thick and too kind of wadgy. The lovely thing about this yarn is you can get this very definite um, cable pattern but it doesn't kind of overwhelm it or feel that the garment just then feels a bit too tight yeah, and heavy. Yeah. Now I think I want to go back to this design here because mm. quite often knitters will see a design that they want to knit mm. but they just want to change the whole set of colours. Yeah. So maybe from a warm palette to a cool palette or maybe colours that are very opposite mm. to more blending colours. So yeah. what are your best tips for doing that without disturbing the beauty of the original design because yeah. that's the key point yeah, yeah right so this example of nail yarn um which i was saying earlier you know it's really good for intarsia so you can see here it's perfect for doing um a patchwork yeah before i put the colors together 
I just wanted you to make sure there was balance. I mean, I knew that one of the good things about it is when you've got an equal proportion, that's actually a lot easier putting colours together than if it was in a fair hour where one colour can suddenly make everything else, you know, like tumble down. <laughs> so what I tend to do is I'll do a stripe first so I can see if I like the balance and then start working on the patchwork once I think that's right then I can work on the patchwork yeah. and the squares then yeah but the other thing I think that's really useful about that is that actually then what happened was I thought oh that's nice <laughs> um I rather like that you know the white or the gray in between so then I did a crochet sweater using the stripes okay so it leads on to another design yes. you have to watch yeah. out <laughs> okay and then for some a completely different mm. look what have you done here? Yeah. I started off by thinking, um, oh, because there's actually a grey that might work. I took, I wasn't interested in that. And then, quite, and then I thought, you know what, that's actually a bit boring. Well, well, it's obvious. It's very obvious, I thought. So I then thought, actually, that would look lovely because I love the way that the green kind of gives some energy into yeah. these colours. Yeah. But it is going to be, it's more of a subtle palette than this. Yeah, yeah. So it'll yeah. look very elegant. So mm. you've just got three shades of purple yeah. and the white, and even this is cool. Some people may not like uh, an orange, so they could easily substitute red for there and it would still work equally as well. Yeah. Okay, so just take a colour that's similar in tone and substitute it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It does take some time to get it right, and you do need to experiment uh, beforehand. Okay. Rather than even embarking on something that you think, when you see them in ball, it works, but actually when you kind of think, does the diagonal work as well? Is yes. it not just the, you know, the top and bottom, the colours, yeah. how that works? Yeah, okay, great. I actually find it really exciting when designers do a crossover between yeah. knitting and another craft and Debbie has used embroidery in quite a few of her designs so I thought you could show us some of your favourite mm. motifs and embroidery stitches. Yeah, um, the first time I ever saw embroidery on knitwear was uh, my first day at school, uh, it would have been in 1955. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, there was somebody called Marlene sitting opposite and she was wearing what we would call a Tyrolean cardigan which were very popular at the time so I had the pom-pom and stitches like this that, and then there was embroidered colours around the bobbles and I've always liked the idea that you could use embroidery in with the texture of knitting you can do it on something like this which is just plain stocking stitch I'd like to reassure everyone that if you're worried about um, what your embroidery is like if you haven't done it very much I am really bad at it but actually when it's on knitwear I like to say to myself actually it doesn't have to be perfect you know in a way perfect makes it looks like a machine knit yeah so um, you know it can feel be more bold. rustic yeah it can be more more sort of folkloric yeah uh, look uh, but I particularly like it as I say when it it ties in with a uh, a texture so here you know you've got the chevron in the bobbles and just uh, outlining it in green and then you've got the little uh, kind of daisy stitch there daisy daisy stitch is a really easy one to do okay and um, that's this one here yeah and then this would be you know experiment this is like a, a strong bolder color this is um colors a softer palette that i used um in a cardigan that's um there's a pattern for too and then I did a layette set called Flower Baby. And um, this is gorgeous. what I used here. So instead of using texture and raised texture, I used an eyelet and then did a little daisy um, around uh, stitch it. around the eyelet, okay. which is really easy to do. Here's one I did earlier, as they say. Okay. Yeah, so really, really easy to do and just really effective. And actually, if you really want to do some embroidery and very nervous... You can just do something really bold and um, you can see how I'm not that great in boy group, but <laughs> it was when I was thinking of cushions, if you just wanted to zhuzh up a uh, yeah. cushion that you might have, yeah. um, that just do some really bold things. Yeah. And Actually, even just a big chunky sweater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do some crazy yeah. embroidery on you it. You could have, yeah. take like an Aran sweater and give it some zhuzh by just outlining the patterns with um, a bit of embroidery. That's such a good idea. What I love here is your little bee. Very fond of the bee. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
that's just gorgeous. So those yeah. are those instructions in in the with the yes. Pattern? So they're in there too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. He seems to have slightly lost his way. But it's like I, he just can't choose. <laughs> Um, <laughs> too beautiful yeah, yeah. and this one is really the most complicated yeah. yes it is so, so um, what stitches have you got in there um oh, you've got a satin stitch you've got like a little knot stitch this is um like a kind of chain stitch which is really easy to do but as i say none of this is none of it is perfect but um as i say i think it lends to its charm you, some viewers may have seen the moth holes <laughs> as well <laughs> and that's another thing if you have a moth hole yes. and you can embroider over it yeah um, yeah that's fantastic mine would have quite a lot of embroidery on <laughs> i remember poor madeline she's behind the camera right now but i knitted her a beautiful stripy sweater and the first day i think she put a big hole in it so i put a little fake pocket over it and her initials, I think. Right. So you That's can, very clever. Yeah, well, you can do that on kids' <laughs> yeah. stuff very easily. Well, look, Debbie, it has been really wonderful to have you on Fruity Knitting. Oh, it's I'm been lovely. It's been such a privilege. Good. Thank you so much for asking me. Great. Okay, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. So welcome back. Debbie is so charming and we really had a great day with her when we were filming the interviews. And I chose to edit the interview slightly differently this time and by using the intro and the ending of both interviews to show you some of our behind the scenes footage. And I think this is a really fun thing to do for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you get to see or gives you an idea of what happens on the day with all of our preparation and also you get to see another side of Debbie and she's just kind of relaxing and having fun in her home. So our second interview with Debbie's right at the end of the program and that's a really fun and intimate interview so I think you're really going to enjoy it. It's full of lots of funny stories. And as Debbie said in her interview she's now part of the Lovecrafts team and Lovecrafts is offering fruity knitting patrons a 15% discount of all the Debbie Bliss yarns and patterns. And there's a large range of yarn that comes under the Debbie Bliss name, including a variety of blends and weights to choose from. And each yarn range comes with a collection of really gorgeous patterns. So thank you very much to Debbie Bliss and also to Love Crafts. So we'd like to remind you that Fruity Knitting is only possible to produce through the financial support of patrons and it is really inexpensive to become a patron. You can do so for just the cost of one coffee per month and every single patron makes a big difference to us. Yeah. So please support our work by becoming a patron and thank you to all the wonderful patrons who have kept the show going so far. Now we're into under construction and we're going to check up on Madeline's chess set. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I aim to finish all of the high ranking chess pieces in time for this episode on both sides. Yeah. I wasn't sure I'd make it because it takes me about an evening to sew up one piece. And I didn't quite make it. There's one white knight missing, but yeah. apart from that I'm delighted with the results. Here's a picture of all the figures lined up. For the white pieces I chose a combination of light blue and light purple. I've already discussed most pieces in detail but the black and white bishops are new. And the bishops are wearing simple gowns with either a red or a purple stole around their neck. They also carry a staff which is very easy to make. You simply take a white pipe cleaner, add some glue and then wrap yarn around it. I'm very pleased with how the two sides have turned out and now all that's left are the black and white pawns. Now this chess set is the first project in which I'm actually sewing up and embroidering toys and I find it a bit more complicated than the finishing I've done on my garments so far. So we wanted to take you through the steps of making up the white king, which is this guy here. And I say we because mum's a bit more skillful than I am at making up toys, so just for this demonstration she'll be doing the sewing while I do the talking. Now most of the chess pieces are fairly similar in that their head and body are knitted in one piece and then the arms and all the accessories are sewn up afterwards. Uh, like the chessboard, mum, you're dropping all the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> like the chessboard, you use mattress stitch to sew up the pieces and to embroider the faces you also use the same techniques across all chess pieces. So that's fairly easy. Like I said, we're demonstrating this on the White King and his accessories are his sword, cloak and crown. I've been just trying to show people the black and white versions of everything. Mm. So that's the black bishop and the, and the white bishop 
and the here's knights. the black knight and the white knight there. They're pretty cool. About to take him out. <laughs> and what else have we got? I, I like the bishops. Toys. Yeah, I do. I like <laughs> the bishops best. And then we've got the two queens. Yep. And I really like, we were deliberating for a while on what colour would do, but I really like the blonde hair and the gold mm -hmm. crowns. Mm -hmm. I and like the, that And too, the gold yeah. armour here yep. as well. <laughs> These are all the knitted bits and pieces that belong to the White King. Right now he looks a little bit like Frankenstein's monster with all of his parts laid out, so let's hope he turns out more handsome at the end. As with all chess pieces, you start from the bottom up by sewing together the base of his robe. Then you take a metal nut attached to a round piece of cardboard and glue that onto the base. This weighted card will prevent the king from falling over. Keep sewing until just below the neck and then fill the body with stuffing using a pair of tweezers. Then you join the rest of the seam, stuff the head firmly and pull a gathering thread through the stitches at the crown of his head. Now we have to embroider the face. Alan gives precise instructions on where the eyes and the nose should be placed. You embroider the nose first using two vertical stitches with the second one slightly longer. And the ends are tied off at the back of his head. Then for the eyes, you split the yarn and take out one of the strands. That way you get a thinner yarn in exactly the same colour. All the white pieces are going to have green eyes to match their soft colour palette. The eyes are two single, tiny horizontal stitches. Unlike the other pieces, the king doesn't have a mouth because his face is covered by a thick blonde beard. The back of his head looks ugly now, but his hair will cover the ends. Next, you sew up the arms and attach them to the body. Then you sew the cloak around his neck with a couple of stitches at the front. The king seems to be wearing a purple cap. This is actually the crown lining and we want to embroider a simple cross onto it. Then you attach the finial to the centre of the cross and glue the crown onto his head. After that you glue on his hair and his beard. Finally, you glue the sword to the king's robe and glue the king's hands to the sword hilt to make it look like he's holding it. Doesn't he look great? Now being chess pieces, these toys will be handled frequently as mum's demonstrating. Um, so you want to cover them with ultra strong hairspray and gently pat that into the knitted fabric And this will help the toys keep their shape, but also protect them from getting dirty. So that's really good Are you going to make people wear gloves when yes. they play? Yes, absolutely no Cleaning one's, gloves. <laughs> everyone's prohibited from touching these with their bare hands <laughs> I have to say it's very addictive playing with the little characters. I've I've made the the bishop catch the white queen's eye I think they might have an affair <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I didn't play with Barbies enough when I was a kid. Yeah. They're gorgeous. Well done, Madeline. Thank you. 
Okay, so we have some exciting news because in a couple of weeks' time we're going to be attending the Swiss Yarn Festival, which is held from the 14th to the 16th of April. We're going to turn up a couple of days early and leave a couple of days late, and during that time we'll cram in as many interviews as we can for you. So the Yarn Festival is held close to the Swiss-German border, near a town called Glattfelden, Glattfelden. Which, which translates as smooth fields. Smooth fields, or, yeah. yeah. And that's about one hour drive north of Zurich. So over the last few weeks, we've been madly preparing to do a series of interviews with some of the lecturers who are going to be there. And we're also going to do some mini interviews with a selection of the vendors. So back in 2020, Andrew and I covered the Swiss Yarn Festival and we just had a wonderful time back then. Every yarn festival has its own unique atmosphere and I think what's very special about the Swiss Yarn Festival is that many of the vendors and the guests are multilingual. So as you're walking around the marketplace you have all these different cultural flavours coming at you. So it's sort of like having France, Germany and Italy all together under one roof and that's a pretty special thing. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> and um, oh, it's the festival's held in an old spinning mill and it has an idyllic river running alongside it, so it's a beautiful location as well. Mm. So our next episode will come out right at the end of April and that'll be our coverage of the Swiss Yarn Festival. Yeah, and coming up now is part two of our interview with Debbie Bliss. Hope you enjoy that and you'll see us next at the Swiss Yarn Festival. Thank you for spending time with us. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm here again with Debbie Bliss for our second interview. In our first interview, we concentrated more on Debbie's creative process. And in this interview, we're going to chat about more personal things, including Debbie's insights and reflections, looking back on her long and successful career. It's a real privilege for me to be here with you again. Thank oh, you. It's wonderful to have you here again. Good. So you were awarded an MBE mm. in yeah. the... 2015 Queen's Birthday Honours List, I have to get that right in my head, <laughs> for your services for knitting to the knitting and craft yeah. industry. And I think that's such a great acknowledgement, both for you individually, but also to the craft of knitting. So oh. tell us about the day that you got the award and what it meant to you. Oh, yeah, uh, but they, they send a letter, so it was a complete shock to me. And then you have to post it back um, to say that you've accepted it. And then I remember saying to Barry, you know what? Oh, what if it doesn't get there? <laughs> Wait, no, it's all right. And then some time later, you went, oh, no, I've looked in the honours, you're not there. I said, oh, it never got there. Then I was on holiday in Morocco, and suddenly my phone kept pinging and pinging and pinging. It was because it was in the birthday honours. He'd been looking at the wrong list. Um, but I'm really glad that you said about not just for you, but for the industry, because I honestly felt that, I think you must feel that, that often craft, and knitting in particular, and I think historically, because it's been something that women have done, people can be really patronising about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I used to have radio interviews when people would go, I'd be interviewed, they'd go, it was always men, and they'd go, well, I just thought it was something old women did. And I went, well, for all you know, I could be an old woman, and now I am. It's just like, but it's, um, yeah, I do yeah, think, so oh, at last, you know, there is the acknowledgement that what, as crafters and knitters, that we can actually bring to an, to, and that it, it's an industry as well it's not just a hobby absolutely I mean a lot of people have to well they end up justifying their occupation don't yeah, they yeah through it so yeah that's great and mm. did the queen give it to you personally no it was prince charles okay and I was wearing um a hat like a flying saucer which started to um they teach you how to curtsy on the way up but I got in a terrible leg twangle at the same time <laughs> trying to hold on to my hat um <laughs> And then we had a very interesting chat, obviously, j just for two minutes before he pinned it on, which was about yarn bombing Trafalgar Square. Yes, because of the campaign yeah. for wool. Yeah, he said he'd had a great idea um, uh, to put uh, bobble hats and scarves around the statues in Trafalgar Square, but they couldn't get the money. Yeah. He's, to be fair, he's... I thought he could have loaned them a bit, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. They also had the idea of... Um, putting a carpet right across a wall carpet right across London Bridge yeah which would have been a great idea yeah but I think it was too mm. heavy for the cranes to get there um. and actually do it 
but fantastic ideas. Yeah. He's full of ideas and yeah. knows a lot about wolves. I feel yeah. I should point out rather proudly too, even more than the MB, that because I had my son in Bart's hospital, um, that it allows him to uh, herd sheep over London Bridge. Something he's never actually tried out yet, but... <laughs> That's great. Because he's in that, you know, he was born in that area, so there yeah. are certain rights and privileges. Okay. You can get married in St Paul's, but also herd sheep over London Bridge. Oh, that's so funny. That's why I love the UK. It's just <laughs> such a crazy country. <laughs> okay, now, your career has really spanned nearly 40 years, mm. and through your work, you've travelled all around the world, yeah. you've given workshops and you've met mm. lots of different types of people mm. Mm. so I'm just wondering if you could look back and if there's any interesting or funny stories you could share with us perhaps not a traveling one but I did um when I first left uh art college I made um plants that's what I did you know cacti and flowers and I sold them in um you know Liberty's the big department store in London and I'm and I had to, it took me ages to find out how to do it so I'd put um uh, plaster of Paris in a garden hose and that I knitted I did a big cheese plant knitted on out of lurex and things like that and then um, it was bought by um, Elton John's business manager at the time and sadly within a week it went back because my proportion clearly of a plaster of Paris and garden hose hadn't quite worked out for the stem what so it just co- I think yes it, it did, collapsed yeah. yeah I think it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it probably just went yeah he probably paid a fortune for it, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. That's pretty funny, yeah. Uh, one of the strangest things I have, when it, it's very odd when your name is the brand and you can become disassociated with it. And yeah. one of the first big stitches shows I went to, I was incredibly nervous anyway, but also in the catalogue they'd put a picture of a completely different woman, much younger woman, and there was a sort of reception before one of the shows and I was talking to somebody, a little drink, and then she said, oh, I, I hear Debbie Bliss is coming, because obviously it was a different picture. And in my nerves, I went, <laughs> oh, lovely, and turned round and looked at the door. And then I realised, oh, that's me. And I didn't know what to do. Do I go, oh, well, that is me, which would just made me look completely <laughs> deranged. <laughs> Or just carry on looking terribly excited about this person that was coming. So. <laughs> That's really funny. So later on, if you were giving a speech, you yeah, thought that you nightmare. were taking her off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but do you know, one of the nicest things anyone said to me, I can remember uh, I was in Toronto and I was staying in the same hotel as uh, Kate and Brandon. And um, I, I didn't know them very well at all, but Brandon said to me, oh, do you know something that um, we've always really admired about you? And I suppose I kind of, you know, think, oh, perhaps they like to say they like the designs or something. And they went, because you always have to travel on your own. And you know what? I just thought, oh, my God, <laughs> they saw me. <laughs> it was just brilliant that they kind of got how hard that yeah. could be. Yes. Um, and I used to feel terribly self-conscious and always worry about is that the right right airport or what happens when mm. I get there or what if I can't change planes in time you know it was just like yeah. it ticked every anxiety box that I have definitely and it can be mm. lonely can't it oh yeah really lonely yeah um, I mean I've learned a lot through it you know like having more confidence because you have to do things and forcing yourself you know to go into a room to have the breakfast bar or something yes. like that actually do now but yeah no it was it has been a big kind of learning curve yeah definitely it's quite and people don't really assume that because you're a very public figure and and you've got the smiles mm. and you're doing mm. the work very professionally but then it is quite a lonely thing yeah no it is and <clears throat> I think too because um I'm able to cover that up quite well if I say oh no I was really shy and self-conscious people go oh no, no you weren't and I go no actually I was mm. um but it, and, and I can remember the first workshop I ever did was in America, but I went to see one in uh, Cambridge first to see how it was done. And I think I said to somebody that came, I'm going to do this and I'm so scared. And she said, well, always remember that actually there'll be people there that are more scared than you are because mm. perhaps they've come on their own. Or And yes. I've always remembered that, that sometimes 
you might be feeling self-conscious or you know a bit inadequate but there's going to be someone there yes. too that very probably feels the same way so I found it quite good in say workshops to think I wonder if there's a person there that's me um, or may not want to ask a question in case they look a bit silly or things mm. like that so mm. I think I've yeah I think I've developed skills through being that scared myself yeah and empathy Empathy for, for different people mm. and situations yeah, and yeah. The, the ability mm. to be able to work with different people. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah. And also yeah. the knitting community is such a lovely one. So um, a lot of the things that I was worried about don't really happen because people are very welcoming anyway. That's true. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do want to get on to the year 2017 mm. because yeah. it was such a tough year for you. It was, yeah, it was, yeah. The designer yarns became insolvent, yeah. which had a huge impact on your mm. business mm. because you'd worked for very hard for nearly 40 years building yeah, it up yeah, and yeah. it looked like it could disappear mm. overnight. Mm. And then soon after that, you were diagnosed with breast cancer and had to go yeah. through chemo and radiotherapy. Yeah. So are you? can you share with us how you actually got yourself through mm. that very challenging and stressful Stressful period of your life. Yeah, the first one with when so to just to explain, designer yarns were my um, distributor. So I did all the creative things, all the all the bits that I loved. But warehousing, you know, buying the yarn, I didn't have to do that because by being a distributor, what they did is they gave me the opportunity to launch my own yarns. So I wouldn't have been able if I didn't have any, mm. you know, financial resources to yeah. do that myself. So when they became insolvent. It was a really, it, it was a kind of devastating time. Um, and also, in it's that kind of fear of the unknown. You just don't know what might happen. And in order to try and find a buyer, you know, you do a lot of, um, you know, um, I, I can't think of, of the word, but it's when you, that lawyers get involved, they yes. have to go through all oh, the... Due diligence. Due diligence, yeah. that's right. So it goes on and on and on. And, and in order to do that, that was horribly expensive so I, was, I I got to a point where if somebody hadn't have bought me then we would have had to sell, sell the family home and all the things that are comforting to you as you mm. know like your family home and mm. where your children have been brought up so I, that was just overwhelming and then luckily Lovecraft stepped in so yes Lovecraft bought me I think that was signed in um, 2018 and then I was diagnosed with breast cancer at uh, the end of 2018 and then actually at the end of 2019 was diagnosed with thymus cancer so I managed to go for a twofer just <laughs> just to add to my woes. So what kind of mental attitude or what what helped you handle that stress or get through it looking back now? The stress of the um, the work thing was just overwhelming but like all these things, you don't have an alternative. You just mm. have to try, you know, try and find out what you can do, whether you can sell the company or, or just resign myself to the fact that um, I wasn't going to have my yarn anymore and all that, say, everything that had gone into that. With the cancer, I think it was completely different. And, um, you know, as you know, you enter a completely different world that runs parallel with your old one or even your existing one. And it then becomes this strange, otherworldly thing of constant, you know, weekly um, hospital appointments. News, as it was with me for quite a long time, got worse. You know, things changed. Um, so then I had a series of operations in um, yeah, two, 2019. That was, as the Queen once said, her my Annus Horribilis. Mm. Um, but then looking at it in a glass half full way, if I hadn't have had breast cancer, I would never have found out about the thymus cancer, which is very rare. So if I look at it that way, um, the, the chemo was hard, but I carried on working. Um, in some ways I look back and I think perhaps I was a bit silly and Lovecrafts were great. You know, I can remember Edward, one of the founders saying, you know, you don't have to come in unless it's a distraction. I did find it a great distraction. Um, but you seem to strike, you strike me as someone who does look for the positive mm. and sort of tell a joke or just be happy, uplift yeah. yourself. 
constantly. It, was that what you were doing on yeah, a day-to-day I mean, basis? There were some. I mean, there were some things that were funny. I can remember when, um, just before I went in for my mastectomy, and a young, didn't have a great bedside manner registrar came in and he said, da da da, and then he said, "Is there anything you want to get off your chest?" Well, my husband <laughs> nearly fell off the chair laughing, um, and I went. Oh, what you mean? Apart from my left breast, do you mean? And he just looked absolutely <laughs> Maybe my right one. <laughs> and I was still laughing when the nurse came in, and she said, "I bet you didn't laugh." I said, "No, you just looked really embarrassed." And there was um, my other lovely favourite story is um, because it had gone into the lymph nodes. It was whether um, it had gone into the bone. So, and uh, and then my lovely um, uh, cancer nurse rang up, and she said, um, "Come in tomorrow." And then there's a, another scan on the Saturday. So I went into um, on the Friday for my scan, for the bone scan. And um, when I went in, the um, radiographer went, she said, you know what she said? We only really do um, heart people today. She said, but your nurse came down. She made such a fuss. And I said, we don't do cancer. And she said, she's got cancer and she's lovely. I said, well, to be fair, <laughs> I said, I do have cancer and I'm lovely. And she went, oh, get out the violins. And then just before I went in, into the scanning machine, she put a blanket over me. And I said, oh, thank you for tucking me. And she said, not really. I've liked your shoes. I was going to nick them while you're in there. But for me, it actually helped me. Yeah. Because sometimes by having that little bit of banter, mm. um, I don't know, it just, it just kind of uplifts your spirits anyway. Yes, um, it does. But also I think also with my lovely nurse, Anita, with the excellent banter I've been giving her, she was able to march down there and get me in two weeks earlier. Yeah. Always a good thing to establish a rapport. Uh, with your nurse. <laughs> with your nurse. <laughs> okay, we'll remember that. Now, I want to get back to Lovecraft because mm. you've now partnered with them. Yes. And they're like the next generation of entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. So what new ideas mm. or outlooks are they bringing to the craft world? Do you know, I, I absolutely love them there. First of all, we're all called SKMs, and that is uh, abbreviation for Smart Kind Makers. Oh. I love that. And the SKM. emphasis... Yeah, SKMs. And I think we could all call ourselves that anyway. When the enf- emphasis is on the kind. Yeah. And one of the, But one of the first things I noticed was is that I have to say that previous to this, I'd worked into what's still a very male-dominated industry and actually I think a very conservative male dominated industry where as designers you were just I remember a sales rep saying to me oh well you you just you designers you just like sit in a garret and you just design what you want to and no no we're you know we'd like to make a living we have to be commercial as well but there was that kind of attitude or I think I remember a sales rep saying to me once like doesn't matter whether I'm selling a knitting yarn or I'm selling washing machines it the same thing and I thought no, oh, actually, I don't think it is. So going there, there are lots of these wonderful young women are working there too. And I find that even in marketing meetings, there'd also be a bit where we'd all start talking about our projects. And there was that excitement and people would say, oh, I think I'm going to go on this course. Well, should we do this as a group? Let's do, um, I don't know, paper cutouts. Let's do embroidery. Let's do watercolours. So... To be in that atmosphere, I just found so lovely. You've got a lot more interaction now, yes. you think, oh, absolutely. than you yeah. had in the past, and you, feedback. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, it's yeah. wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, um, I do honestly think they're a fantastic community. They're very aware of, um, in the company, men- mental health, um, diversity, inclusivity, mm. um, all the, you know, really, really important issues. Mm. Um so yeah it's as i say there's a lot of kindness there good Mm. that's lovely to hear actually i want to ask you how you think that the knitting the world of knitting has changed over Mm. the last 40 years you've said you've you've reflected that a little bit in that answer there but in what other ways do you think the world of knitting is might have changed for example um, the kinds of projects people tend Mm. to knit or the skill level of the average knitter or how we perceive knitting the most important thing that's happened is this community of knitters and crafters. Mm. And then what happens, I think the knock-on effect from that has also got to be that people tackle um, perhaps more complicated yes. things because you're, 
not in isolation anymore. exactly yeah. that you can say oh i'm stuck to mm. there be somebody there that's done it before mm. or yeah. um so i i think that's i think it's really exciting because i can remember a time in the early days when i'd meet people who it would be their mothers knitted but they didn't and then suddenly it'd be oh my mother doesn't knit but my grandmother does and you yes. did think is this the beginning of the end but so what has happened it's been brilliant because young people have invigorated, you know, they started with the fancy yarns, um, which I personally didn't have a kind of empathy with, yes, if you like, yeah. because I like, you know, stitch detail and things like that. But they were incredible in that they brought people brought in, brought people yeah. in, you know, people could knit a star- scarf without having to worry about the pattern or... Or holes. Yeah, or holes, yeah. <laughs> they did hide a multitude of things. They did. Just like they hair. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Now, throughout your career, what would you describe as being particularly easy for you and Mm. particularly challenging for you? Yeah. The thing I can do is have the ideas. You know, I'll be, you know, I can brim full of them. You know, I can sit, I can, I might be sitting in a, waiting for my fish and chips and I'll go, there's a serviette. Well, I've just had this idea. Constant envelopes looking at shops, looking at what somebody's wearing and thinking, that's a great colour combination. And I can remember at the end of, um, I did, you know, fashion and textiles, and at the end they had an outside assessor came in and looked at all my sketchbacks and went, oh, you've got some great ideas. So many of them, why have you never made any of them? And so I would say the thing that I find easy is filling a book with scribbles and ideas and a kind of is that constant whirring, that's not the problem. <laughs> the problem is, is when you start to knit it and it doesn't work and you realise that, or that the repeat is so massive that you can't grade it. So it's just like the initial thing is all excitement and oh, 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 no problem. And, and then, then the practicality yeah, of making it, it into slowly something. slowly sinks in. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, that's interesting. Now, we have a great blanket on the floor here, which is Mm. actually a history of your knitting because it's made up of many different Mm. past design swatches, isn't it? Yeah. So I thought we'll show it to the viewers. But they've Um, probably all got a little story and and they belong to different collections. I mean, upstairs in the the room I work in, I've got drawers and drawers full of swatches and some of them, oh, they must go back 40 years um but then I just they were overflowing and I thought I'll start making a blanket and also because rather than just like go through them like I do and everything goes onto the floor until I find the one swatch right at the bottom that I've been looking for this way it's easier so it is a lovely little memory um and even say recently I put in I can find it um it'll always be at the other end won't it that's (laughs) life isn't it um, so that was a fair aisle from the Highland Fling that we were oh, talking okay. about. Oh, okay, yes. That's uh, from a collection mm. from last year. But this yeah. is a swatch. I used to work with the most wonderful knitwear designer. Her name was Melody Griffiths, and sadly she died um, from breast cancer. That's been about 12 years ago now. But because we used to work together, she would bring in her ideas and swatches, and also um, her husband gave me all her sketches and swatches because he said she would have liked them still to be passed round, which I thought was a lovely idea. So, But that's one of Melody's swatches that I have there to remind myself of the massive um, talent she was. I like this one here. It's got a little bead in the centre. Is that from a a child's collection? Yeah, I think it was from All Seasons Cotton Book. So we're talking about, well, probably 15 years ago. And these are great examples of colours I've hated. <laughs> Got to, to remind myself, oh, Deb, never use please that. Don't do that again. No, <laughs> I love gingham, so I always like to have a little bit of gingham anyway. Yeah. So I say, in many ways, it's you know, it's it's not something you could show with pride, but as a <laughs> as a little history, I yes. just keep adding to it as soon as my drawers get um, uh, fill up again. Isn't it, it's like everything. It's like perhaps in your garden there's a little bit that you like when everything else yes. is a bit... I was thinking there was... I really like those stripes together. Um, and there are some other stripes that I like. That's a really old one, as you can tell from... From the, the few... Yeah. Yes, we might um, get some embroidery over that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that... 
That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now part of being an artist or a creator mm. is looking back and wondering how we've evolved over our lifetime. Yeah. So when you look back, how would you describe your evolution, both professionally and also personally? Mm. Definitely personally, I would say that when we were talking earlier about that lack of confidence or travelling on my yeah. own, those things I still don't like to, to do. I'm very kind, I'm very family orientated. There was a time when my, when my daughter was older, luckily, where she used to, where Nell would come out with me and I loved that um, when we'd go to shows together. I've got lovely friends, but I'm, I'm not a great person for doing things on my own, even if I'm happy to do things on my own in the house, as long as I can still hear a little movement. I think my life is about like when you used to go to this bed when you were a child, but you could still hear yeah. things around in the house. Yeah. I think that's my world view. Yeah. I like to still hear okay. things around in the house. So, so that has definitely got better. My confidence has got better. You know, I went from, you know, being terrified of a group of 12 to then I think once in Canada, um, talking to over a hundred people and I could never have imagined that. So I think my... Through so, doing it. Yeah, through doing it. And yeah. sometimes when I see people, particularly young people, who suffer from the same kind of thing, and I just want to, I, I can say, you know what, sometimes doing it, it's like a book that I never read, but I love the title, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Because I had to do it, otherwise I would have felt terrible that I hadn't done the travelling in America, done that. And you had to um, do it for your work. You so had to do it, you. so yeah. it forces you to do it. So... I think that's had a huge impact on me. In terms of the work, I feel that it is, if you've been doing it a long time, it is very difficult to to stay fresh, definitely. On the other hand, there is only so much you can do with the knit knit and pearl stitch, Mm. you know, you can't Mm. keep reinventing the wheel. But I feel during stages that I've learnt things all the time. I've learnt things from knitters. I've learnt things about inclusivity mm-hmm. I've learned things about um, how we grade patterns up for them to be more inclusive um, but, uh, and also again that with new technology um, and with the things that that there's a wider community that you can reach as well more can, interaction exactly yeah. yeah and as an independent designer you can put your work up and get directly to your consumers mm. so you don't have to hope it goes in a magazine mm. or yeah. hope that a shop takes it. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I think it's really exciting. Well, it's been such a privilege for me to have you on the couch <gasps> with Fruity Knitting. I think the viewers yeah. will love to hear you just talk in this more relaxed, personal yeah. way and get to hear. No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm just so grateful for you um, coming back and talking to me and also the fact that the dogs didn't bark. <laughs> Yes, yes, they've been taken out on a walk yes. to keep occupied, and so we've yeah, been yeah. very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll say goodbye to the viewers. Bye. Bye. Good. How, so, how long was that, Dulce? Okay, I think that was good. I think that was 40 minutes, which was good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.